everyone. Um, I'm here with, so I'm Kelly Dittmar, uh, Director of Research at the Center for American Women in Politics, and here with Amanda Becker, Washington Correspondent for the 19th News. Um, Amanda and I have spent many a time on the phone uh, talking about gender and elections, not only in the last cycle, but in previous cycles. So we thought um, it would be a good time, especially since the 2020 election officially ended yesterday with Rita Hart uh, <laughs> stepping down. So we finally have final, final, final results. Um, and also because Kaw put out a report last week about women in the 2020 elections, um, that it would be good to end our series of conversations with Amanda and her perspective. We've been able to talk to practitioners like Julie Conway and Ashanti Golar, who helped in recruitment and supporting women. We were able to talk to Congresswoman Strickland, who won in 2020 um, yesterday. Uh, and so I'm really glad to get your insights now, Amanda, on some of your thoughts about what happened in the election. So thanks for taking time today. Of course. Thanks for having me. Um, so I wanted to ask specifically a little start a little bit about the 19th news um, and folks obviously a lot of folks who are tuning in probably already know about the work that you do but 19th news launched just in time to do really great reporting I think on the 2020 election cycle and so can you kind of talk a little bit about how the 19th and you specifically approached reporting on the 2020 and women in the 2020 elections. And also if that was at all different from the other reporting you've done for other outlets um, like Reuters and Roll Call before now. Yeah, so uh, we officially, we being the 19th, um, kind of came into existence in early 2020. I came on board in April of last year, and then we didn't officially launch as our kind of our own website until August, around the time of the conventions, the political conventions. Um, and really, it was kind of a, it was the brainchild of our CEO and co-founders, um, Emily Ramshaw and Amanda Zamora. Um, Emily was on parental leave at the end, and during the 2016 election. And at that time, I was covering Clinton for Reuters. And she just thought, you know, we are watching this election that has the first, you know, women nominee of a major political party for president. And there's really just a chance for a different kind of coverage that really takes into account and centers gender as we're talking about politics and policy. And so um, she started this uh, ahead of this election, uh, this past election, rather. And um, it was... You know, I came on board kind of right as the primary was ending, and we just yeah. watched this primary that had all of these women um, vying for the Democratic nomination, and it was clear that, you know, none of them were going to be the one, and it was going to go to another man um, to follow all the other men we've, we've had since the beginning of our country. Um, and so it was a natural time for me to kind of look for something new and to look for a place that I thought was going to approach this a little bit differently. Um, I was lucky at Reuters where I was able to write stories that kind of took into account the gender angle of covering politics, but it was a story. It wasn't, um, I didn't approach every story I did that way. So I was excited to come over to the 19th um, just in time to kind of, you know, see that first uh, woman vice president put on the ticket um, and also to cover all these amazing women who ran in House and Senate races. So I uh, specialized um, my, my beat at the 19th is Congress and just general politics in Washington. So we have another wonderful reporter, Barbara Rodriguez, covering state houses. Uh, so I was really focused on a lot of these um, House and Senate races and Senate, um, especially just, you know, we didn't know who was going to control the Senate um, after those elections and whether it would flip from Republicans to Democrats. Um, it ended up doing that in a de facto way. It's evenly split because the vice president is the tiebreaker on, on things. So technically, uh, Democrats control the Senate now and they're in the leadership positions. Um, but women were in a lot of those really important Senate races last year. So it was really exciting to be in a place where I could really just, you know, all of my attention was kind of focused on that. And it wasn't just an aside or one story that I did throughout that cycle. And it was such a service. I mean, we talked early on, I was, you know, Got to talk to Aaron in those early days too about what this was going to be and for those of us who do this work it's such a great outlet to see these stories sort of amplified and to be able to get into the 
nuance of some of the gender and intersectional stories instead of having to fit it in one story, right? And I'm sure I can imagine on your end that also is nice to not yeah. have to say, okay, I have to fit everything into this one gender yeah. story. But for us, it's also really refreshing because it means that there's more attention to a lot of the stories that we track along the way. And we're saying like, no, there's more to it. You know, we can say so much more on this, um, which is why I wrote a 16,000 word report, but you know, <laughs> well, talk I, I'm about not service. a good reporter. <laughs> I mean, you, you all are doing a, a service to reporters such as myself yeah. and other reporters yeah. because you know, it's, it's hard to find places that even track some of the things that you're tracking. Um, so, you know, I, I cannot tell whoever's watching how many times I have, I have called Kelly over the past few years when I was at Reuters and at the 19th um, to ask her these questions. And they're doing really amazing work. And the report, you know, kind of brings it all together. I appreciate it. So part of the, 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 the report is about, like, what is the gender story or what are the gender stories of the 2020 elections? And, and in the report, we're focusing really on legislative because, of course, one of the biggest stories or the biggest story, arguably, is electing a woman vice president. But what in your mind, as you sort of reflect and we're writing um, throughout the cycle, what do you see as the gender story or stories of the 2020 legislative elections? Um, from a congressional standpoint, I think the story is that, you know, women competed in some of the toughest, tightest races for both House and Senate seats this past cycle. And I think it showed that they can win in these kind of districts, districts that swing back and forth, um, especially when their party invests in them as candidates early on, which until this year um, was a bit of a problem on the Republican side, if you're wanting parity in terms of women making it onto the ballot. Um, so it was really interesting to be able to cover races, to go to places like, um, you know, the district in suburban Indianapolis, where there, you know, a Republican, Susan Brooks, who had actually been in charge of recruitment for House Republicans, and she had been in, you know, sounding the alarm, we need to get more women in here, we need to get more women. Um, she had decided to retire. And so it was an open seat in this kind of suburban district that everyone thought would be a bellwether for what was going to happen last year in terms of, you know, not only the presidential, but congressional races. And you had two women providing that seat. The Democrat was Christina Hale. The Republican was Victoria Sparks. Um, actually, Christina Hale was favored to win that race just by a little bit going into it. Um, and uh, Victoria Sparks won. And so you had Republicans holding on to an extremely competitive seat in suburban um, America, kind of in the Midwest, this typical you know, place that you think of when we were talking about the suburbs last election. And you know, it really showed that if you get, you know, you know, when women make it onto ballots, they're able to win. And it was really interesting to see multiple competitive races where it was actually a woman competing against another woman. Um, so I think that, you know, a story from last year is not only the number of women who ran, um, the rates at which they were successful, particularly in these competitive districts. It's so important. And, and we had a record number of all women races. So that was one example. So it wasn't only we had a record number of all women races, but that a lot of these, as you're noting, were amongst the most competitive. One of the things, you know, we put out in the report is it also was true that of the five incumbent women who lost, four of them lost to women. Um, and I asked Julie Conway about this from ViewPath, um, which supports Republican women. There was a sort of narrative of like, or questions, and I think we were asking questions. I assume you were asking it, we were asking, is the Republican Party targeting you know, women in women races uh, to, to, to have a woman woman race? And we looked into it a little in the report and it doesn't, like that's not necessarily true, right? That doesn't bear out to be true once you look at the contest. But in these most competitive seats, there was a lot of that happening, that it was just two women against each other, um, which on one hand is progress. On the other hand means that we don't increase the numbers uh, of women in office because they're replacing each other. Were there stories um, along the way or even now that you think sort of gender and or intersectional stories that you think didn't get a, enough attention, even with the work that you all were doing? Um, you know, were there things that people maybe overlooked or didn't pay as close attention to that you think were really interesting? I think 
particularly on the voter side, I not so much the candidates, but I think mm -hmm. women as voters are always undercovered because they're treated as a block and women do not vote as a block. And talking about women voters is really simplistic, even if you're talking about urban women or suburban women or rural women. Um, women are not a monolith and you often see them treated that way, um, especially in, you know, cable news talking points and things like that. And oh, well, a lot of assumptions are made. If you're a woman, you must support this. Or, you know, I saw, I saw a lot of assumptions about women voters, um, frankly, up in Maine when I went to go cover the Senate race there between Susan yeah. Collins, who was trying to defend her seat and Sarah Gideon. And, you know, women believe a variety of things. They have a lot of I different ideologies. And so I think that that is always... Um, oversimplified in traditional media coverage of politics. And that's one of the reasons why the 19th exists. Um, so I think that's one narrative. I think uh, another thing that would be tangential to the election is the role that women have played in some of the extremism yeah. um, in terms of the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th. Um, you know, we hear a lot about the Proud Boys. We hear a lot about um, you know, you know, other male centric groups, the, the three percenters. Um, but we don't hear a lot about women and women were a part of that movement. They are very much a part of the QAnon movement and pushing those conspiracy theories and engaging in those. So that's something that I don't see the role of women voters talked about enough um, because, you know, that's one side of the spectrum. I was just talking about, you know, women fall everywhere. So, you know, I think that's one uh, from the from a voter standpoint. That's one thing that I do think was undercovered. And that's such an interesting history, too, not to get too sort of deep into it. But we struggle with this because the gender gap, right, looking at the gender gap in voting was really the start of that. The roots of that are in women's organizations trying to leverage this power as a block even though we know it doesn't sort of function that way, right? But to say, no, you know, particularly Democratic Party, you have to listen to us as women. Um, and so now recognizing and recognizing that, that women are not monolithic, which is like, you know, our repetitive uh, phrase that we often use in the work that we do. Um, but at the same point, then still leveraging if there is collective power or even power within, you know, specific groups of women to push parties, push candidates, etc. So it's always a, an interesting tension, I think, um, in how, how we talk about it. Um, you know, I was thinking too, one of the other points you're making about women not being monolithic, in, at least in my opinion, one of the stories that maybe gets covered a little bit less or differently is all of the other Republican women who won other than Marjorie Taylor Greene and Laura Boebert, right? So you, you sort of get this story that all of the Republican women who won are in the same vein of ideological positioning. And that's just not true either, right? Um, so that there's real diversity, both ideological and in terms of backgrounds, where they come from um, for the women who won, not just Republicans, but Republicans and Democrats. Yeah, I mean, you had for every Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, which are, you know, Lauren Boebert is a representative from Colorado and Marjorie Taylor Greene is, uh, you know, they're, they're, they've become the ones we hear about, but. There, for, for each one of them, there was 10 or more, you know, moderate Republican women who won in these suburban districts, like I was talking about where Victoria yeah. Sparks ran and won. Um, and, you know, you just don't hear about them. Now, part of that is just because it's, you know, not as newsworthy um, yeah. or you know, of interest to readers, I guess, um, as someone who falls on kind of one end um, of the spectrum because, you know, the Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene are thought, you know, they're, they're pretty far to the right um, and have engaged in some conspiracy theories and, and things such as that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you don't, they, they did get the attention. So I think on a can from a candidate standpoint, that was covered from the, from a voter standpoint, I think that wing That's of right. the party was less covered. And then, you know, from a candidate standpoint, the, the people in the center weren't, weren't covered yes. because they just aren't as, you know, as exciting um, or making as much news. Yeah. 
Speaking of sort of exciting, is there um, one of the things that you know I'm like always keen on paying attention to is how women run, right? So not just thinking about how many women run, um, but what are the ways they sort of navigate gender and race on the campaign trail? Um, and we spent a lot, of, I spent some time, like a whole section in the report talking about that. But I'm curious for you, as somebody who's observing it, who you are talking to candidates, you know, going to sort of uh, track Victoria Sparts or others, you know, were there things that you saw and observed among the women candidates and sort of how they were running that you think is important for us to be paying attention to? Um, I think one thing, and this would go back even two cycles ago to 2018, is that, you know, women don't all run in the same way. You know, we, yeah. don't, we don't believe the same things um, as voters. We don't fall on the same part of the political spectrum as all other women. And you see that reflected in the way candidates are running. You know, some women running for office um, talk about the role of gender a lot, you know, and they, they tend to be more liberal Democrats. Um, some never mention the fact that they're a woman as a differentiator or talk about their gender much at all. Um, for example, you know, you didn't see uh, Kelly Loeffler in, in the Georgia Senate race talking about her gender much. And part of that is because uh, traditionally in the Republican Party, they have, you know, rejected what they would call identity politics. So you don't see a lot of Republicans really focusing on that in their race in the same way that that Democrats might. Um, there are some exceptions, obviously, um, you know, just like I was saying before, Su Rep Representative Susan Brooks in that Indiana district who retired was one of the Republican women sounding the alarm saying, you know, it's not identity politics to say that, you know, it's important to get women on ballots because they can win. Um, and, you know, in 2018, we saw when there was the influx of Democratic women that year, we saw a lot of women with national security backgrounds, for example, who had been um, CIA, FBI, members of the military. Um, I think all of them were reelected in 2020, that group that I'm talking about. Um, I can't think of one that lost their race. Um, and so, you know, they obviously were running on their national security credentials. You know, they weren't running on, quote unquote, women's issues because, you know, there are, you know, many women who will point out that all issues are women's issues. And, you know, we don't only care about one or two things um, at a legislative level. So it really just depends on the, the race. I think from the races I've covered, they were as varied in terms of, you know, how they were running as the men that I've covered in the past. Which is right, which they should be allowed to yeah. be, and we should yeah. celebrate, right? Yeah. That's the, that there's not one, like, I mean, the question that women candidates right, get annoyed at is like, so how are you running as a woman? And, yeah. you know, you always hear them say like, well, I'm not running as a woman. But I do think that sort of gender variance, and especially as we have greater racial and ethnic diversity, even gender um, identity differences among the women, you start to see women definitely in 2018, more in 2020, leveraging those identities to say, this is a value added. Uh, this is a credential that I bring. I bring a perspective and experience that is different. And that's different than the 2008 Hillary Clinton, I'm not running as a woman, I'm you know strong and tough and I can kind of meet the masculine credentials of the job. Now, granted, you mentioned Loeffler who also had that Attila the Hun ad, um, so, which was very much like, right, I am, I'm strong and tough and kind of, again, more, more traditional in the sense of aligning with masculinity and what we think about in elective office. But always interesting to sort of look at those dynamics beyond just whether or not women or men are running. So I, I want to say yeah. one dynamic you, I did see on the campaign trail a lot was even in races where the, the, the women candidates were not centering gender in terms of what they were talking about. Um, outside ads and outside entities yeah. uh, definitely either directly or obliquely um, made gendered references or uh, gendered attacks on, on the candidate that they were running ads against. Absolutely. And I point out in the report, Justin, I've said this to you, I mean, it was clear throughout the cycle, if you look at sort of gendered and particularly racialized attacks on the freshman women, mm -hmm. um, the fact that you had uh, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez really attacked in almost all house races. I mean, you, th this was not, you know, this sort of didn't, didn't matter whether or not it was a woman running or a man running, um, but certainly as the face of radicalism.
Uh, and that was not a very veiled, you know, attempt to say these young women of color, you know, Muslim women, um, that they, they are threatening. Um, and so I think that being aware of those ways in which gender and race are used as well as importance. Um, so as we look ahead, as we get, a, we're already in the next elections. We're already we, in we are. Well, there's some, there's some special elections happening. Um, Absolutely, just in the next few months. So. Absolutely. So what are the what are the questions you have? What are the stories you want to be looking at? Um, things that you're tracking in in regard to gender and intersectional dynamics of you know electoral politics. Um. Yeah, so I, I'm looking at some of these special elections. So, you know, as we've had some women enter the administration, um, we just found out yesterday, uh, for example, that New Mexico will have its special election and, and a woman will be on the Democratic ticket in that. And I believe if she wins, and it is a heavenly, heavily um, Democratic district, so there's a, there's a pretty good chance. Um, I believe if she wins, and I, I will look up the, the district <laughs> breakdown right now as, as I'm talking, um, that, will be, that will remain the only all-woman House delegation in the country. And that'll be two Democratic women and one Republican woman. Yep. I'm keeping track of that race. Um, Ohio has an has a interesting special election um, and it will be, I think the actual election is in August. Um, yeah, I think so. yeah, the two front runners in that election, and that was a seat kind of in the Cleveland Akron area vacated by Marsha Fudge when she left the house to go to the administration. Um, two black women are the front runners for the democratic, uh, yeah. slot on, in that race. So, you know, and I think that, you know, we're going to see more and more of these elections, not just where it's a Republican woman, um, competing against, against a Democratic woman in the general, but at a primary okay. level to have the front runners. It, it's, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see women um, not only represented, but representing both parties and then even within the parties representing the different wings of that party. So, for example, in the Ohio race, that is seen as kind of a contest between the kind of the progressive um, wing of the Democratic Party versus the traditional wing of the Democratic Party. And you have two women of color who are who are the front runners for that. So that's something that I'm going to be looking at over the coming months. Um, we have a few women up in the Senate next year. Um, most of them are in safe races, not all of them. Um, so I'll be tracking that pretty closely. And really, it's just, you know, great to see kind of women now in all facets of kind of the political map and to be able to cover them kind of with the nuance that they deserve. No, absolutely. And then all these specials are really keeping us busy, though. You know, yes. like, as I was joking about us being done, I'm like, yeah, but it's true. We have, you know, we Several. have special election. Julia Letlow will be sworn yep. in as another new Republican woman. Louisiana as well, another black mm -hmm. woman in a runoff. Um, very, you know, well situated Karen Carter. Texas. Uh, Texas special election. Yes, as well. So, so basically, we'll keep talking. Yeah. So we'll have a we'll have a, a a reason to do another one of these once we get more of these results. But I do want to be thoughtful of your time and just thank you for taking the time to just have of this course. conversation. It was kind of fun, and I hope that we can do it again. And I want everybody who's if you're not obviously already following the Nineteenth News, check out nineteenthnews.org um, and Amanda as well on Twitter at Amanda. Becker, follow all her stories. She's also written a piece drawing from our new report, so we'll share that around as well again on our channels today. And if you want to check out the full report from COP, it's at womenrun.ruckers.edu. And I will say Amanda. we also have a free newsletter, so sign up and yes. you will see all of our coverage and you will see um, the center's work cited quite frequently. <laughs> Highly endorse the newsletter. Definitely get the newsletter every day and the weekly one. Mm -hmm. And also, um, not just because COP is cited sometimes, because it's really great work, and I really appreciate the work you're doing. And please share your share the thanks with the rest of your team as well. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you, and thanks to you as well. All right, bye. Bye.